Hey everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me know if you can hear me. It sounds all right. All right, you guys can hear me? Perfect, all right. Here. Well. Hope we'll have a lot more. It's only 70 guys so far, and there should be 62. where it's meltdown o'clock at my home right now so if you hear some screaming in the background that would be the children do not call department of children and families to come investigate me i appreciate that Oftentimes my wife would be worried about us like carrying one of our kids having a meltdown through the park or something. And said, well, won't someone call the police or something on us? And I said, well, cops show up. They can be, they can babysit for a while. That's fine by me. Most other parents just say, yeah, we get it. We've been there before. Get started in a few minutes. I have a couple questions up on the sticky board, so if you have any others, you can feel free to add them in. Got about those. Can we get started on cardiology part two because I think we finished up uh, the hematology stuff last time. It was good seeing everyone yesterday for the first time. That was uh, really nice getting to interact with you guys a little bit and. Um, too, I think it's good to see the professor sort of uh, interacting with one another too a little bit there just to see how we, we actually do communicate with one another. We like each other uh, for the most part. So yeah, it's really good meeting all of you. It's funny, like the number of people are just like, wait, is that, is that Dr. Wood? Oh yeah, it's Dr. Wood. All right. Yeah. I was surprised how many people actually did recognize because um, normally by now I have everyone's like face and name pretty well down for the most part because I'm used to seeing them in person so much. But uh a few I'm still able to pick out, which is good, even with the face mask on. So there's that for sure. And hopefully, you guys, um, you know, take a lot away from those grand round sessions because I really think they're super valuable. It's one of the most like I think important things that we initiated within the past, probably like probably with uh, Kelly and Steven's class. If you guys got to hang out with them a little bit, um, oh, the next prescription assignment is already posted. If that's not the case but yeah they, they are really valuable sessions i think just to get a feel for like you know, how do i communicate this stuff to um you know to other providers and how do i kind of collect my thoughts and come up with um you know a plan in order to manage these patients if you look on the modules yeah, if you look on section two of the modules, the prescription writing assignment is there. Um, yeah, sorry I didn't post it up in the homepage. I can do that. Um, but uh, yeah, that'll be due next Friday. So I'm going to get your guys' assignments done tonight. And so you'll have feedback by Saturday morning. So that's my my guarantee to y'all. You all, I suppose I should. Yeah, so that's updated now. So that's over there in the homepage. You can see that, um, but it's on the uh, the module section too. That's where I'm used to posting it. So I forgot to do it up in that uh, schedule page. So my bad, but it's there. Um, so it's twelve thirty. Let me start the recording. All right. So I did have a few questions um, on the sticky board here. So people uh, that they had. So someone said. For a patient who was given heparin and they developed heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, would you switch them over to fondaparinux, which has a low incidence of them developing HIT, or would it be better to switch to a direct thrombin inhibitor? Good question. So um, again, the risk with switching over to something that is heparin-like is that you could have a cross-reactivity with that. So certainly, you know, you wouldn't want to give someone with a history of HIT anoxaparin because that risk is too high. Uh, with fondaparinux, it happens to be the lowest. 
So, but someone who's like actively having hit right now, um, because they're at a point where they are having this reaction, they're having these little microemboli that are forming potentially, the platelet counts low. I want something that's gonna anticoagulate them like right now. And so definitely wanna switch over to a direct thrombin inhibitor, right? Because that's gonna have no cross activity between that and, and heparin. So switch them over to that for the meantime. Um, now, what would happen in the future, say for instance, a patient was to have a hip replacement and they needed to be on um, prophylactic anticoagulation afterwards, and they have this history of hit, then something like Fonda Paradox might be an okay option to give them because that cross reactivity is pretty low. Uh, fortunately, you don't run into too many patients with HIT, um, but you'll you'll see it every once in a while. It's one of those things that can be uh, potentially really problematic if you don't catch it and, and kind of manage it. So anyway, uh, that one. Hopefully my wife is coming to grab that child because she is screaming quite a bit. Um, hey, why are glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors given with heparin and sometimes aspirin? Um, so those are going to be in cases, we might mention this a little bit later when we get into like um, talking about acute coronary syndromes a little bit. Um, but frequently when you have someone who's like going in for like bypass surgery or they're going back to the cath lab, you want to have kind of multiple mechanisms all working together to try to make sure that you don't have any further clotting happening, right? Um, because something happened for that patient to cause that acute embolism to occur, uh, whether it be due to a piece of like atherogenic um, plaque breaking off and that triggering off a, a clotting um, uh, happening in the coronary vessel or something like that. So by giving um, like aspirin on top of a 2B3 inhibitor, one, you get two kind of antiplatelet activities. And again, via different mechanisms, which is handy. Uh, and then with the heparin, you also get the benefit of having an anticoagulant on board. So you're kind of attacking it from two main pathways there to make sure the patient is not at risk for having further clotting occurring. Now, of course, you know, the risk is bleeding, but you know, they're in a relatively, um, you know, hopefully not gonna be like, you know, having a whole lot of trauma happening when they're in the hospital, but you know, so it, it's kind of a balance between those two. And we have a lot of protocols set up, and a lot of experience with this because Fortunately or unfortunately, we have a lot of experience with acute coronary syndromes because they are pretty common. Heart disease is a big killer of Americans. And so we know the protocols um, that allow for the sort of the most efficacy while minimizing the toxicity there. So uh, someone said on one of the slides, it says the ADP receptor blockers bind P2Y12 receptor and work synergistically with aspirin. Does this mean you can give both at the same time? I thought you would give ADP blocker instead of aspirin. Um, yeah, so in those cases there, so it depends on the situation, but um, if you had someone who would benefit from aspirin, uh, say for instance, they've had a history of coronary uh, ischemia or something like that, um, and you want to try to prevent future events from occurring, that's where you can go ahead and utilize like daily aspirin. But if they couldn't receive aspirin, then you could use uh, something like an ADP blocker like Plavix instead, right? That's kind of the alternative. Or in the case of you're having like an acute, uh, like an NSTEMI or something, or let's say you like you placed a stent in one of the vessels and then you needed to keep them um, on antiplatelet therapy in the, um, the immediate after term, I guess that's not really a word, but in the immediate after uh, math of putting that stent in, usually they'll do dual antiplatelet therapy. So that's where you'll see the combination of aspirin and Plavix or Prasugrel or Ticagrel or whatever ones. Uh, and by using the two together, that helps to really make sure you don't have any platelets start to grab onto those stents. Um, Cause again, you can either have like a bare metal stent, you could have a drug eluding stent, and but either way, any kind of foreign hardware you're putting into the body, um, the body wants to grab onto that and wants to bind onto that. So just like with someone with a mechanical heart valve, they are more likely to have um, clots and you have to shoot for like more aggressive things like warfarin therapy, for instance, um, putting in a, a bare metal stent could have the same sort of reaction. So body doesn't like metal a whole lot. It likes to clot up against it. And that's why we have to give this um, dual antiplatelet therapy or in the case of warfarin, you know, anticoagulant therapy to, to, to manage that. Okay. Hopefully that makes a sense. Um, let's switch over and go back to our PowerPoint here. So now we're going to get into cardiology part one. I've only got 40 of you guys in here and a few individuals. I will assume that there is some uh, watch parties happening here. It's kind of like, you know, when Game of Thrones was coming out and everyone have big parties to watch. Uh, nowadays, no parties happen. They shouldn't be because of COVID. But let's talk about um, lipid lowering agents here. This is kind of our first foray into cardiology. Um, talking about medications that help to manage these patients who have hyperlipidemia, who are at risk for arthro sclerotic, uh, cardiovascular disease, things like that. And so hopefully we've covered some of this with uh, Professor Vai already. But um, let's talk a little bit about like fat metabolism in the body and cholesterol synthesis and all of that and kind of 
um, how we're going to be managing this in the body. So two big sources for dietary fats. You know, we're going to see we have cholesterol and we have actual dietary fats coming in through our diet, right? And so, of course, depending on who you are and what kind of diet you, uh, you know, are ascribed to, um, you may have more or less of this coming in, right? And so we're going to look at sort of the life cycle of fat going through the digestive system and then into the, the systemic circulation and kind of what happens to it. And the big things we're going to be focusing on are how we're processing this cholesterol, how we're processing triglycerides and whatnot, and then how the liver plays a role here. Because the liver is like going to be one of the major organs that helps us control things like cholesterol levels. And okay, so a typical American daily diet, maybe like 100 grams of triglycerides, 250 milligrams of cholesterol here. And once those get ingested into the GI tract, they can then sort of be incorporated into these things called chylomicrons, right? Um, these are kind of going to be the precursor molecules to a lot of things like we talk about things like LDL and things like that. This is what we're going to be starting off with here. And you can see um, in this case, in this picture here, you know, you have dietary cholesterol coming in. You also have a lot of biliary cholesterol, right? So there's going to be a lot of recycling of cholesterol through the biliary tracts. So you can spit it out through as bile salts. Um, to help emulsify and break down fats and cholesterol and whatnot in the GI tract, and then you can reabsorb that. So there is a recycling that happens there, and that's going to be important for some of the mechanisms of the medications we're going to be using to help lower um, our cholesterol levels here to, in order to help us be a lower risk for developing cardiovascular disease. Because, okay? again, it's not the fact that we just want a lower LDL level, right, because that's the bad cholesterol. We want a high HDL level. There's other implications to that in terms of our risk for cardiovascular disease. So anyway, so you have the dietary cholesterol coming in, you have the biliary cholesterol breaking that down into smaller, more absorbable particles here, and they can go through these cholesterol transporters. And then eventually they're going to get turned into these cholesterol esters. They get sort of um, uh, esterified in this process here, and they get incorporated to this thing called a chylomicron. And this is sort of like the precursor molecule, as I mentioned, to um, all these uh, you know, LDLs and HDLs and all that sort of thing there. Okay. So what's going to be happening here? So as I mentioned, the dietary fat carried by the chylomicrons. And you can see here the molecules, how they kind of change as time goes on. And you can see the balance here between cholesterol esters specifically and the triglycerides. You can see early on in the chylomicron, a lot of triglycerides, um, not so much in terms of the cholesterol esters here. Um, okay, sounds good, Nicole. Um, be, be socially distant, so maybe an angle the laptop in such a way, whatever, whatever you gotta do. Um, so anyway, so the triglycerides, um, you'll see over time we'll get hydrolyzed by things like lipoprotein lipase. This is an important enzyme here um, that helps to break this down. And then eventually you get these chylomicon remnants, essentially. This is what it kind of looks like here. That's lipoprotein lipase starting to break that down. That then gets taken up into the liver here. There's what we call these LDL-like receptor proteins. These proteins, um, these receptors here on the surface of the liver are going to be really important because the more that we express these receptors, the more that we're going to be taking up these cholesterol molecules and these triglycerides and things like that. So that's, that'll be an important concept. We'll talk about a little bit more later on here. Okay. Now, what do we use all this cholesterol for? What do we use these triglycerides for? Well, basically we can do a lot of things with them. So for one, like the phospholipid bilayer that makes up a lot of your cells, like, well, that's where those come from, right? The cholesterols and things that we're taking in the triglycerides we have taken in through our diet. Like that can go on to become things like cell membranes, right? We can turn that into arachidonic acid to make inflammatory cytokines. We can make hormones, right? If you actually look at cholesterol, um, what it looks like, and then you look at uh, a lot of molecules like estrogen and testosterone, they share a lot of similarities because a lot of cholesterol turns eventually into those hormones. As we see later on, we talk about endocrinology. Um, but so you can see they can do that. They can be re reesterified, or they can be go ahead and dispose of the bile acids, right? Bile acids are helpful because they can again help with emulsifying more of the fat that we're intaking through our diet. Okay, so we're still in the liver right now. That's kind of what's happened so far. So looking what happens next. Now you have these carbohydrates and these fatty acids. They can then be converted into triglycerides, right? So there's another process here happening in the liver itself, and then they can be released as what they call VLDL. Okay. And in fact, when you're measuring, uh, if you get someone's lipid panel and you get their tri uh, triglycerides, you're actually measuring VLDL. There's a bit of a conversion you do there. Because if you look here, it's a very high proponent of, a very high proportion of triglycerides, not so much on the cholesterol esters. And we'll see that there's a flip at a certain point where it's going to be more cholesterol esters and very few triglycerides here, right? 
So how does that happen? Well, that uh, triglycerides here actually get hydrolyzed again by lipoprotein lipase. This enzyme is still functioning here, and it will then help to turn VLDL into intermediate density lipoprotein, and then further activity will then convert that over into LDL, which we know to be through your bad cholesterol, that low density lipoprotein, okay? Against further um, hydrolyzed either due to things like hepatic lipases or um, lipoprotein lipase, all those sorts of things. Now, LDL floating around the system we know is not great because it can do things like deposit into our um, endothelial, um, uh, you know, the, the vascular uh, cells, endothelial cells there, in the vasculature, they can um, cause oxidation, they can cause a lot of inflammation to occur. Um, ideally, though, what we can do is either deliver those LDLs over to places like the cholesterol pool, out into fats and things like that. Uh, macrophages will take up some of these and turn them eventually into HDL, but also a lot of these LDLs will be taken up by the liver, okay? And then it can still do things like produce uh, hormones or it can be used to make those cell membranes and things like that. The more that we can take up LDL out of the blood through the liver, the lower LDL concentrations are gonna be. And this is gonna be one of the main functions of a lot of our medications to lower cholesterol is gonna be, is to help increase the number of LDL receptors expressed on these hepatocytes that uptake more LDL out of the bloodstream. Okay, that's how we're going to get those levels down. I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit here. And so um, other things are going to be happening here. Eventually you get that HDL, which we know to be helpful because it can help to kind of scavenge a lot of things like um, uh, triglycerides and whatnot and kind of deliver them back to the liver. That's going to be our um, sort of uh, healthy cholesterol. We want high HDL levels. We want low LDL levels in general. Let's see here. And this is just a table sort of showing you um, you know, kind of the ratios here between things like triglycerides to cholesterol ratios. You see here in the chylomicrons and the VLDLs, it's quite high on triglycerides, which is when you're measuring your lipid panel and you measure triglycerides, that's what it's going to be measuring there. Um, then all the way down to LDL and HDL, it's going to be almost going to be all cholesterol esters at that point, right? So then we're going to see here, what do they do? Well, again, remember LDL, and this is the mechanism of catabolism, how do you actually break them down? Remember, um, we're going to see the LDL is really going to be taken up by these LDL receptors in the hepatocytes. And the way that the LDL is going to interact with those receptors is through this protein called ApoB100. This is actually an important uh, protein that the LDLs will express on their, on their surface. Um, and if you're missing those, you actually have a really hard time taking up LDL out of the bloodstream and you can actually get really elevated LDL levels. So it's actually a, a genetic uh, condition that some people will have developed there. Um, on the other hand, HDL is going to be able to deliver things like cholesterol esters uh, to VLDL, to LDL, or it can just take it up by, into the liver itself, right? So again, it's kind of scavenging a lot of cholesterol esters from, from other places in the body and then taking them back to the liver. That's why they're, they're so healthy, right? Here's what an example of an apolipoprotein would look like, like a VLDL in this case here. You can see all of the cholesterol is going to be sort of uh, forming the cell surface here uh, versus you're going to have all the cholesterol esters and some triglycerides are going to be located within the core of this. And it can, again, as you metabolize more of those triglycerides and it's going to turn more into the cholesterol and that's when you get your IDL and then eventually LDL. Um, here's an example of those lipoproteins so like ApoB100. This is what it would look like and that's what's going to interact with those LDL receptors to be taken up by the liver. So anyway, looking at low density lipoprotein itself, we can see here that um, they arise from the catabolism of IDL, as we mentioned there. And then the ApoB100 is the, apo lipo the apoprotein that is gonna be binding to the LDL receptor. So this is the important concept. If you're missing this, you're gonna have problems with really high LDL levels. And so what we can also do is if we can try to mediate more LDL receptors being expressed, on the hepatocytes, we're gonna have a better time taking them out of the bloodstream. And thus, if they're not in the bloodstream, then they're not, they're not there causing inflammation and atherosclerosis and all those other things there, okay? And again, if you look to see how important this is, LDL receptors are responsible for clearance of 75% of the LDL particles. So this is gonna be a major drug target. This is gonna be a major place. And we're gonna have multiple mechanisms to help out with this process of getting more of those LDL receptors. But keep this in mind, this is gonna be the important thing that is gonna happen here. Again, lower LDL receptor activity, means you're going to have more particle accumulation in the bloodstream, and that leads to the atherosclerosis. You're going to narrow off those coronary vessels. You're going to have more uh, inflammation causing free radicals to form, causing oxidative damage, all these horrible things that having too high blood cholesterol can, can lead to, right? Here's what it would look like if you were to see a, a molecule of LDL interact with the uh, LDL receptor here with the ApoB100 uh, Protein here. Notice here these interact. This is kind of the lock and key sort of mechanism we're used to seeing with drugs 
and receptors, they get internalized. They can then start to break things down in these lysosomes and allow for cholesterol esters to be uh, released and they can go off and do whatever they're gonna do, right? It gets broken down and then eventually that cell receptor is gonna be put back at the cell surface to interact with another LDL molecule. Well, what would happen, for instance, if the hepatocyte was like chock full of all this cholesterol already, right? If it had too much of it to begin with, well, then it probably wouldn't be really putting a whole lot of these receptors back at the cell surface. And so that's gonna be a problem with someone who has a lot of LDL to begin with in the bloodstream, is that typically the hepatocytes kind of full up on it already. And so because of that, they're gonna be expressing fewer LDL receptors, and they're not gonna take up as many out of the blood, and that's what leads to that accumulation. So one of the big things we're gonna see that our drugs can help out with is actually trying to reduce the amount of uh, amount of cholesterol within the hepatocytes. If you can do that, then it's going to say, hey, we don't have enough here to produce our hormones and our cell membranes and all that kind of stuff. It's then going to upregulate the expression of LDL receptors. That's one of the big ways we're going to see our drugs actually work here is reducing liver cholesterol content to express more LDL receptors to take more of it out of the blood. Okay. So here are some of the different drug classes we're going to see. And you can see there's a lot of different places that this can work, whether we're focusing um, on preventing absorption of fats from the GI tract, whether we're affecting cholesterol synthesis within the liver, we're going to look at all these different ways to manage it. We're going to talk about the main ways for the most important means of treatment for hyperlipidemia and reducing overall cardiovascular risk. Okay. So what are the drug classes we're going to talk about here? Well, first off, we're going to talk about sort of the, uh, the gold standard, the MAC daddy of cholesterol lowering the HMG CoA reductase inhibitors which is a bit of a mouthful, so instead we just call them the statins, right? And you can always tell the statin because it ends with the term statin, the suffix statin. Uh, so things like atorvastatin, fluvastatin, lovastatin, uh, statin, patavastatin, pravastatin, rosuvastatin, and semvastatin. We're going to see not all of these are made equally, um, but again, this was um, a big deal when these first started to come out. They realized how effective they were at lowering cholesterol. We realized how well they worked to help reduce the risk of um, coronary events and they help to improve, um, they extend life, they reduce mortality. And so that's why you see so many of them because of the fact that it was sort of like a blockbuster medication. And so everyone wanted to get in on it. So everyone would come up with their own version of the statin and say, like, look, we got our own option here. Let, we want some market share too, right? Um, so that's why there's so many. You'll see this a lot with um, things like blood pressure medications. You'll see this with diabetes medications. Whenever you have these disease states that affect a huge number of people, and again, look at the number of people dying from heart disease in the U.S. and the people with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and, and metabolic disorder, and all these things, it's a big market, right? There's millions and millions of people we could be treating here, and so drug companies are incentivized in order to come out with their own versions of this stuff, which is why you end up seeing this kind of uh, dogpile sort of mentality with that. Now, as opposed to like antibiotics, which is like, you know, can barely get a new antibiotic out every year because of the fact that it's just not as big of a market share. Uh, and so they're not as financially incentivized, right? So some of the natures of uh, big pharma, unfortunately, do not really, uh, you know, it's like, hey, we need drug development over here and we don't always get it where we need it. So anyway, so there's that with the statins. There's going to be the cholesterol absorption inhibitors. So we'll talk about the zetamine briefly. We'll talk about the fibrates. We'll talk about bile acid sequestrant. So kind of the mechanism, mechanism is right there in the name. And then we'll talk about nicotinic acid and then finally the PCSK9 inhibitors. This is the newest class of uh, lipid lowering agents we have here and those are pretty interesting that we'll get into in just a little bit. Let's talk about the statins. Those are kind of like the big big deal here. These are going to be like the mainstay of therapy for uh, lowering serum lipids for reducing cardiovascular risk in patients. Um, these are a big deal and so most patients are going to end up on this at some point um, if they have cardiovascular disease, um, you know, hyperlipidemia, a lot of reasons and again these are the main class of drugs you're going to use as opposed to niacin, as opposed to the fibrates, all, all that. We'll talk about those, and they have their own place in therapy, but really the statins have taken over, and most guidelines recommend these as like, this is the drug that people need to be on. Okay. Um, so again, here are the main ones you're going to run into. There might have been a new one out there recently, but again, the newer ones typically are going to be a little more expensive because they're brand only. Some of these have been around for a while, so they have you know generic versions. And so this may lead you to choose one versus the other. There's some other factors that we'll look at as well here. And a lot of it has to do with things like drug interactions. Most of you have probably seen Simvastatin before. I probably asked it on a few quiz questions or test questions so far um, because it is important in terms of drug interactions. So if you don't recall why, we're going to talk about that in just a few moments here. Right? So anyway, so what 
in the heck are the statins doing? Well, if you actually look at the process of cholesterol synthesis, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of steps that go on within the liver in order to develop new cholesterol, right, in the hepatocytes. And so here what we're going to do is we're going to block this. We're going to take the statins and we're going to inhibit cholesterol synthesis in the hepatocytes. Okay, what is that going to do for us overall? Well, it's going to have a lot of downstream knock-on effects. First off, one, you're going to have less intracellular cholesterol. Makes sense because you're making less of it. The synthesis has now been inhibited. Okay, This means that you're going to say, well, wait a second, we need more cholesterol within the hepatocytes. How are we going to get it? Well, we're going to take it up from systemic circulation. So this is where you're going to see upregulation of LDL receptor synthesis. Right, You're going to see that they're going to be putting out more receptors on the surface here so that way they can take up more of the LDL out of the bloodstream. So some other things will happen. Because you're producing less cholesterol, you're getting less uh, VLDL molecules being sent out here. So overall, VLDL uh, levels will go down, right? So you're going to see the serum LDL is going to go down because more of it is being taken up through the hepatocytes. You're going to see that more um, uh, VLDL remnants, more IDL is going to go down. So overall, you're going to have a reduction in most of components of your lipid profile, right? You're going to see a little bit of an increase in HDL. But for the most part, you're going to see everything else go down. Okay, we'll look at some reasons why that is in just a little bit, right? Because overall, we're getting more receptors at the cell surface, so we're going to be sucking up more of that stuff out of the bloodstream, right? The more we can suck it out of the bloodstream, the less of it's there to interact with our vessels. So that's one way to do it, and right, it's all good to get your cholesterol levels down, right? That's all well and good, but that's not the only thing of why we like statins so much. And so here's a nice new term for you. Many of you might not have heard of before. I certainly hadn't heard of it before. I learned about statins. Uh, it's this term called pleiotropic. Pleiotropic is kind of a fun word to say. Uh, and it can wow your friends when you talk about the pleiotropic effects of something. These are sort of the effects that are like the added bonuses of getting some of using a medication that are outside of just its mechanism of action, right? So, what's the mechanism of action of uh, you know statins? Well, they inhibit cholesterol synthesis and they lower serum LDL, right? They do all these extra other things that don't really make sense based off as just as pure mechanism, but they, we see these effects. We see they help with all these things because they've done huge studies with these medications and we know they work, right? Um, and so what do they do? Well, they do things like improve endothelial function. They can help to stabilize atherosclerotic plaques so they're less likely to break off and cause a blockage later down in the coronary vessel. You can see they can help with things like vascular smooth muscle cell growth. They inhibit that, right? The less smooth muscle you have around your vascular cells, the more dilated they can become, right? They're more open so that they, they can allow more blood to flow through. If you have a lot of muscles around something, muscle surrounding that vessel, they get kind of cramped in there, right? It's kind of like how bodybuilders can't really like reach around very well. Their mobility is kind of limited because they have so much muscle. Same thing for your vessels. It can't really open up as well. You see they have platelet inhibiting effects, right? We already saw that's really important in terms of preventing myocardial infarctions with aspirin. So antithrombosis, antiplatelet effects are it's nice. Um, oops. You're going to have reduce leukocyte adhesiveness, right? So that helps out with some of the inflammation you can see there at those vessel, uh, sites of infl uh, atherosclerosis. You're going to have inhibitory effects on clotting factors. You're going to have blood pressure lowering effects, reduced ischemia reperfusion injury. This is a big one too. Someone has an injury, right? So if, say, for instance, you block off a coronary vessel, you're not delivering oxygen anymore. Well, what do those cells do when they're starved of oxygen? Well, they start to switch over to anaerobic metabolism. They start to produce all kinds of nasty acids and whatnot. Um, but then what you're going to find is if you start to reperfuse those tissues, you allow for more oxygen to come back over, you end up causing what they call reperfusion injury. It's a lot of oxidative injury that happens now that's oxygen flooding in to this dead or dying tissue. Um, and so this helps to limit that. It helps to improve angiogenesis and overall reduce inflammatory markers, right? So they do a ton of really great things, which is why we use statins for almost every patient, if possible, with risk for cardiovascular disease, existing cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, because you won't see these benefits with a lot of the other classes there, right? Sounds like I'm getting paid by the statin manufacturers. I wish, um, if I could, I would probably have one of those like NASCAR jackets that has like all the manufacturers on there so I can get some advertisement money, but unfortunately, too ethical for that. So can't can't really get away with that, unfortunately. Um, now, looking at this, so 
this table, I don't want you to memorize all the facts on here. I don't care if you know what the Tmax is for all these different drugs here, but some of the things that I want you to sort of focus in on are gonna be a lot of the metabolism interactions that you can run into. So for instance here, um, notice these different enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing these drugs here, right? So for instance, CYP3A4 is really important for metabolizing things like atorvastatin, lovastatin, and then simvastatin. We've already seen that you can have significant drug interactions here that will predispose patients to having significant adverse effects related to high levels of these statins. These statins are really good, but they're not without their problems. We're gonna see they can cause some significant injury if not used appropriately, especially if you add it on board, you know, you have someone who's on a statin and all of a sudden you start them off on erythromycin for something, or you start them off on, um, you know, some other like anti-epileptic drugs to inhibit the 3 or 4, for instance. A lot of things can happen here. Um, but that's not all of them, right? There's some ways to get around that. So for instance, if I had someone who's on a strong CYP3A4 inhibitor and I didn't want to use something like atorvastatin, well, I could use something like fluvastatin instead. It goes through CYP2C9 um, metabolism. Or I could use something like pravastatin. Or I could use something like rosuvastatin or pitavastatin. These all go through alternate mechanisms uh, of metabolism such that I don't have to really worry about that CYP3A4 interaction specifically. This is why you want to look this stuff up beforehand, right? Um, for my test, you know, I would definitely expect you to know which ones will go through 3A4, right? Because of the fact that those are most likely to have the most common drug interactions uh, that we're going to run into. We're going to find a lot of other cardiovascular drugs can also inhibit 3A4 and can lead to some problems here. Definitely, I would know those ones at the very least and know which ones you could use as an alternative, right? If I ask you, patients being put on a 3A4 inhibitor uh, and you need to treat them for hyperlipidemia, which one of these would be most appropriate? Well, Obviously, atorvastatin and lovastatin and simvastatin are not going to be great options, but maybe rosuvastatin is really good. We're also going to see overall that their overall efficacy is going to be different here as well. Not all of these are created equal in terms of their efficacy. They have various degrees of potency. We're going to look at that uh, in just a little bit here. So uh, we'll, we'll get back to that in just a moment. So let's look at their other effects too. Not only are they good at lowering LDL, but they can also get your triglycerides down. And in general, for a lot of these agents here, the higher your triglyceride levels are, the more effective these agents are at getting, being able to reduce them, right? And it's kind of interesting too, because even if you have normal triglyceride levels, like, you know, between, let's say like less than 150, less than 100, considered kind of normal, um, you know, this can actually lead to a little bit of an increase, which is kind of interesting. But if you're sitting at a level greater than 250, actually it's pretty good ability to drop that down. It really just depends on kind of where the patients are sitting at to begin with. Okay. So what are the adverse effects that we, um, I'm talking about here that you want to be cautious when utilizing statins in your patients? So um, common things you're going to run into, you know, some fatigue, some sleep disturbances, some GI intolerances, and overall they get this kind of like flu-like symptoms. And a lot of that comes down to those myalgias that you can get there, right? So there are some muscle effects that you can see. Um, these drugs will have uh, some, some adverse effects related to the muscles we'll see in just a moment here. Not only that, though, but it can also definitely cause some damage to the liver as well. Um, you can see increase in liver enzymes um, as a result of using higher and higher doses of statins. So that's why most statins have a cap on the max you're able to administer for them. Um, and serious liver problems are pretty rare. You're not going to run into most patients who are going to, um, you know, go into fulminant hepatic failure with a therapeutic dose of a statin. Where you can run into problems, though, is if you are trying to drive your dose up too high, or if you have an interaction that's raising levels of the statin, things like that. Or if they have pre-existing hepatic disease, that can become an issue here. And most of the time, what do we do about that? Well, you can get around it by either reducing the dose of the statin or discontinue it until your levels kind of come back down to baseline there, right? Um, and again, liver function is going to be something you're going to monitor pretty regularly when you start a patient on. This. So definitely a baseline, probably like six weeks, three months or so, have them come back, check to see where it's at. See if those liver enzymes are starting to perk up at all. That may lead you to either pick a different uh, different statin um, or reduce the dose, right? So I mentioned the myalgias, the myopathies. Again, pretty rare when it happens, but you still want to educate patients about it um, because you can get these rare cases of rhabdomyolysis, right? And what is that? Well, it's basically this muscle breakdown that occurs here. And it can cause a lot of issues because of the fact that, you know, the muscle damage itself, while painful, while uncomfortable, um, is not really the biggest concern out of that. The big concern is what's going to happen to things like the kidneys, right? All that myoglobin getting filtered through the glomerulus is eventually going to clog up the kidneys. And there's people who are on lifetime dialysis after a case of rhabdomyolysis, right? Um, that's why you always want to worry about if patients complain about, um, you know, tea-colored urine or cola-colored urine. That's definitely a bad sign because that's a lot of myoglobin being filtered out and going through the urine. That's a bad, bad sign. 
Um, but you know, if you have a patient who's complaining like, man, I feel like I just ran a marathon and I haven't gotten off my couch in like two weeks, right? Some of these patients might be more sedentary and they feel all these muscle pains all of a sudden that could be indicative of something going on here, right? You may want to measure something like creatinine kinase to see, do they have evidence of muscle breakdown? Not only that, but all that muscle breaking down, there's a lot of potassium being released that can lead to arrhythmias. A lot of bad things can happen here. So you want to be cautious here. Um, again, warn your patients, hey, let us know if you're having issues with muscle pain, you know? Not likely, but let us know if it happens. We can talk about it and see if we need to do, do anything, right? Um, don't scare them. Be like, well, hey, listen, you might get rhabdomyolysis. You don't even want to know what that is. Right, you got to be to be able to kind of speak, um, uh, you know, diplomatically, I should say, and say, let them know, hey, what to worry about, what to call us for, what to go to the ER for, things like that, without trying to scare the patient. Okay. Now, um, what can we do to try to reduce this risk here? Well, one, um, be cautious with patients with impaired renal function because they're going to be more at risk for renal injury if something like this does happen there. And if we can, use kind of the lowest effective dose possible. Um, be very cautious when we have certain drug interactions that are going to happen here. So, for instance, mixing a fibrate, which we're going to talk about later, can have a decent interaction with statins. And so by reducing doses, you can help to sort of mitigate some of the effects you'll see there. But monitoring is really the big thing, right? Make sure you're monitoring for symptoms. Make sure the patients know what to look for. Have them call you up if need be, and then you can get levels of CK and things like that if, if necessary. Um, if the patient does develop muscle toxicity, you've got to discontinue the statin at least in the interim, right, until things kind of get stabilized. Um, some patients will need to be admitted for this, um, you know, especially if they have any degree of kidney um, injury, anything like that. Flush them out with lots of fluids um, is usually the best thing to, to manage rhabdomyolysis. For them. Okay, so in terms of contraindications, hepatic disease, um, obviously they are more at risk. This is a relative contraindication. Uh, if they have, like, active disease to where, you know, they're, um, clotting factors aren't being made appropriately, their INRs up and they're not on, on something like warfarin, like that's not a great person to start out on a statin. But if they have a history of like hepatitis C or something, that you want to monitor more carefully to make sure they're not going to have any worsened effects from that. Um, pregnancy is an absolute contraindication. You do not want to treat a pregnant patient with a statin, um, which makes sense because if you can't um, produce things like cell membranes, well, guess who needs a lot of cell membranes being formed for all their new cells? Well, the developing fetus does. So Definitely avoid that in pregnancy. Um, and then relative contraindications to be careful mixing with other meds. They can raise levels of uh, um, uh, interacting ones, right? So for instance, you know, relative contra contraindication would be something like atorvastatin, which is a CYP3A4 substrate, and erythromycin. But this wouldn't be a concern if I was to use something like rosuvastatin that had very minimal CYP metabolism. So we'll get a feel for that. I'm going to talk about some of these more commonly than others and kind of get a feel for which ones I think are really kind of the most important out of the bunch here, okay? So um, in terms of drug interactions here, you're gonna see again, a lot of these are gonna be CYP34 um, substrates, so watch out anytime you add an inhibitor on boards for things like the lovastatin and atorvastatin and all of that. Um, we'll talk about some of these meds here coming up in a little bit. Some of these are gonna be later on in the cardiology section, but we'll eventually talk about all of these. A grapefruit juice is one of those big ones that you always hear about, and you're like, well, why should patients not drink grapefruit juice and take their meds at the same time? Um, it's because of interactions like this. You'll find that the grapefruit juice has some components in it, things like naringin and, and things like that, that can inhibit 3A4. And they also inhibit something called P-glycoprotein. If you recall, that's one of those efflux pumps that um, are useful for sending drugs back out into the GI tract. And if you inhibit that, you the bioavailability goes up quite a bit. Yeah, so Brian says it's too bitter for me. Yeah, absolutely. Like most people don't drink grapefruit juice because it's disgusting, right? Um, except for, guess who likes to drink it? Old people, right? The elderly. Why do they like to drink it? I like to think it's because their taste buds start to go out over time, and that's the only thing really um, kind of uh, tart enough or sour enough in order to uh, stimulate their taste buds. Some of us are old at heart. I probably have the maturity of a 13-year-old and the disposition of an 85-year-old, so it balances out somewhere in my 30s, I guess. Um uh, if you, well, you can eat grapefruit and get the same effects there. It doesn't matter if you eat it, drink it. Um, I wouldn't inject it because it'd probably be pretty painful there. Um, so that's the, the big thing you got to focus on there is that any type of grapefruit uh, ingestion is going to be a problem. The juice is going to be probably more concentrated with all those products because, again, it's missing a lot of that pulp and other um, uh, components there. So it's probably more potent with the grapefruit juice itself. So, um, again, you know, uh, watch out for that. It's only going to put too much sugar in it. Exactly. So kind of... Uh, uh, cuts out all of the uh, healthy benefits if you put, you know, pound of sugar uh, mixed with it. But regardless, um, that's the thing you want to watch out for. And again, it's only because of the 3A4 inhibition and the um, uh, the EGP inhibition. So if your patient is not on a CYP3A4 substrate, 
go wild drink as much grapefruit juice as you want i don't care right but as soon as they're on something that is metabolized through three four you gotta be cautious here yeah they don't even have it available in hospitals exactly because it, you don't know um what kind of interactions you're going to run into and it's just safer just not to even have it for the most part you know you need some citrus we got plenty of other fruit out there uh grapefruit just happens to be one of the weird ones that is just fine like this so very very strange um so again you're going to find that statins tend to be the most efficacious best tolerated out of the, all, the whole bunch here right and for unless they have a contraindication serious contraindication these should be the first line therapy if we need ldl lowering okay so this should be the first thing you go with all right, so switching gears, we'll go back to that. We'll talk about management of hyperlipidemia a little bit later towards the end here. I just want to get all of the agents covered, and then we'll uh, talk about how we're actually going to be selecting agents and things like that in a little bit, okay? So next off, we have our cholesterol absorption inhibitor. There's one here called azetamibe, or Zetia is the brand name. And so this one is going to be working, and, and two, you're going to find mechanistically, a lot of these drugs can work synergistically with one another because they ultimately will do same end result actions, of upregulating LDL receptors at the hepatocyte surface, um, although they do it via different mechanisms. And so by combining these together, you can get some additional benefits. So one of the things that happens here, so we mentioned that there's two main sources of um, cholesterol in our diet are coming in through the GI tract. So either what we're sending out through the biliary tract or what we're gonna be absorbing from our diet itself, right? And so remember that's that term I talked about, the enterohepatic recycling. I think I talked about it last with estrogen, but it happens too with a lot of your bile salts. We're going to find that they will then uh, be conjugated in the liver, be excreted through the biliary tract, and then the intestine where they're helping to, you know, um, uh, solubilize a lot of those fats and things like that to emulsify them. Um, you're going to see some of that's going to be absorbed about 50% or so according to this chart here. Versus if I were to go ahead and put someone on something like a zetamide that blocks the reabsorption of this intestinal cholesterol, you're just going to then poop out the rest of it, right? So it really helps to block a lot of that reabsorption. So ultimately, the hepatocytes are getting less cholesterol delivered to them. So they say, well, there's no synthesis that can happen here because we don't have enough of the precursors. So they go ahead and say, well, we need to suck up more of it out of the blood. So let's go ahead and put out more LDL receptors, okay? Different mechanism than what the statins were doing, but you could see here how these two together could be synergistic, right? One's working on direct synthesis within the hepatocytes. The other one's blocking reuptake of this cholesterol um, that is necessary for further synthesis of things like VLDL, right? So this is why you can sometimes see these drugs being uh, given as combinations because it makes sense based off their mechanisms of which ones to mix together, okay? So overall, you're gonna see uh, selective inhibition of uh, intestinal cholesterol absorption there, uh, bigger expression of LDL receptors, and then less cholesterol content of atherogen particles that are out there floating around in the bloodstream because of that, okay? Um, you're gonna find the azetamide itself is actually kind of interesting because it does get um, absorbed to some degree, and you actually find it undergoes hepatic recirculation itself, which is kind of interesting. It also helps to limit a lot of the systemic exposure there, because it kind of just stays within that cycle of the GI tract to liver to biliary tract to GI tract, and it kind of stays in that cycle there. Um, so it limits kind of systemic effects you might see in other organ systems, for instance. Um, so you can see here, um, you get some additional benefits. You would never use azetamide by itself for the most part. I can't really think of a, a situation nowadays where you'd want to use it by itself. But if you needed some additional um, LDL lowering effects added on to a statin, then that could be reasonable. Okay, so that's kind of the big thing you'll see. Um, in terms of adverse effects, pretty minimal for the most part. Maybe some GI upset. Um, you could see some additional elevation in hepatic transaminases, especially if they're taking it with a statin. So I would monitor for that, which if they're on a statin, you're gonna be monitoring L, um, LFTs anyway. So not really too much additional to worry about from that standpoint, okay? In terms of um, drug interactions here, some of these are gonna be interacting with other meds um, that we're gonna talk about during this lecture here. So for instance, um, mixing azetamide with the fibric acid derivatives will come up in a little bit can increase risk of things like cholelithiasis and, and myopathies, right? Um, you may find that things like bile acid sequestrants can bind up azetamide and decrease its half-life because it gets eliminated more quickly. Um, things like antacids can decrease concentrations, right? So we'll talk about antacids being a big offender in terms of drug interactions. We'll get into that more uh, in GI because you use antacids for a lot of like in GERD-like symptoms. Um, and then cyclosporin, we'll talk uh, about that briefly, probably when we get to like uh, autoimmune conditions and whatnot. This is something used frequently for like um, organ rejection prevention. Uh, graft versus host disease uh, for patients who have like transplants and things like that. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, but a lot of drug interactions with cyclosporin for sure.
Okay, so this is that in mind. We talked about the statins. Now we're going to get into the fibric acid derivatives, otherwise just known as the fibrate. So we have three here. We have gemfibrozil, we have phenofibrate, and then bezafibrate. So you see that fib in the name there, that usually can indicate a fibric acid derivative. Okay. So what is this going to be doing? It has, again, a novel mechanism. It's still working uh, in, with some synergy with things like statins, uh, perhaps. So we're going to see here this activates what we call PPAR alpha. Basically, this nuclear transcription factor that occurs um, here. And what we're going to see is that it actually is going to help to increase fatty acid oxidation, leads to decrease in secretion of triglycerides um, in the VLDL particles itself, right? So basically, by doing that, you're going to end up having overall decrease in triglycerides. And because it ends up increasing this expression of something called ApoA1, it actually increases HDL. So as opposed to what we saw with azetamibe and the statins having their biggest effect on LDL, this drug here, the fibrates, are going to have their biggest effect on triglycerides and HDL. So you can start to see here how um, some of these may be better tailored to certain patients if, for instance, they have like a familial hypertriglyceridemia, right? They have a genetic uh, mutation that leads them to have really high triglyceride levels. Well, maybe something like a fibrate would be better for them than something like a strict statin, for instance or if they had low HDL levels and you want to help boost those up, something like a fibrate may be beneficial and for someone like this, okay? But again, they can work in conjunction with other lipid lowering agents as well. So what we're gonna see overall is that total cholesterol may be down by about 15%. Don't worry about these numbers specifically, just have a general feel for kind of the biggest benefits out of each of these classes here. The big ones are gonna be the HDL here, which is HD and the triglycerides here. These are gonna be the biggest changes that we're gonna see with the fibrates. You're gonna see HDL is gonna go up, triglycerides are down pretty significantly, okay? So adverse effects, again, a lot of GI stuff you're gonna see. This is no different than what we saw before. Uh, with other meds, uh, you're gonna see cholelithiasis and then myopathy is a risk as well, which again, if you can see this being mixed with statins, you can already start to see some of the interactions here. Right, so that's why you gotta be cautious when you start to mix and match meds here because you can run into some issues. So um, who would be contraindicated from receiving this? Again, pregnancy would be one I'd be very cautious with using it. Um, again, because you could be affecting the fetus untowardly and causing, causing triadogenicity. Um, severe hepatic renal dysfunction, I'd be very cautious with using it. And if they have existing gallbladder disease, this is just going to worsen that. I definitely would not use a fibrate in someone who already had existing gallbladder disease. So. Uh, in terms of interactions here, you can see actually some increased anticoagulant effect with warfarin. So again, increased bleeding risk could happen. I'd watch the PTI number more closely. If I had to start a patient on a fibrate or they were just started on warfarin and they happen to be on a fibrate, watch out for. Um, the myopathy risk is going to go up with HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. So got to watch for myalgias and whatnot and grab though potentially. Watch out for azetamibe because that's going to increase. I wish I'd stop clicking things and drag them around. Uh, azetamibe is going to be another one too to watch out for because of the risk of having gallbladder disease worsen there. And then bile acid sequestrants. We're going to find there's a lot of issues with these guys. But they're going to bind up things like fibrates and prevent them from being absorbed. We're going to find this is a major issue with a lot of uh, drugs with the bile acid sequestrants. So what are we going to use this for? Primarily, this would not be like monotherapy or initial therapy unless the patient just had primary hypertriglyceridemia. So if they had like a TG greater than like a thousand, right? We said like normals, like less than 150, less than hundred in some cases, um, or if they have low HDL, this would be a good drug for them. All right, up next we have our bile acid sequestrants, uh, sometimes known as the resins. These are interesting because they only work in the GI tract. They actually don't get absorbed at all. Um, so instead of working like azetamibe does and blocking intestinal absorption, of cholesterol, this basically binds it directly in the GI tract, and this binds dietary cholesterol. It also binds a lot of the bile salts that are being expelled from the biliary tract. It's going to bind all those up and overall have a net effect of reducing the amount of cholesterol being absorbed in, into the hepatocytes. And downstream of that, you're going to see more LDL receptors being expressed, and then all the same effects we'd see with like something like that. Okay. But the trick is that these are just working um, in the biliary tract, only working when they're able to bind up to bile salts and, and intestinal uh, dietary cholesterol, and then they just get excreted out from the GI tract, right? So what does that mean? Well, for one benefit to these is that they're not really gonna have any systemic exposure because they're just working the GI tract. Um, and so if you had someone, for instance, who was pregnant and you didn't want them to have a, uh, any fetal drug exposure, this could be a good option there because they're gonna bind them directly in the GI tract, right? 
We can bind the bile acids in the GI, preventing enteropathic recirculation. Just get it excreted in the feces. Overall, less liver cholesterol means more LDL receptor um, being put on the cell surface, more LDL being sucked out of the blood here. Limited systemic side effects. However, because they're sitting there in the GI tract, we're going to see pretty significant GI effects. That's going to be one of the big side effects we'll see here. Um, and so it's one of the few drugs that's actually approved for specifically in children or in pregnancy, right? So uh, there's three drugs here. We have cholestyramine, we have cholestopol, and then cholecevalam. Um, or fit into this bile acid sequestering category here. And so most of these actually end up coming as either very large tablets or as powders. Look at me, I'm so bad, I put QD on. Um, I'm gonna take points off my own grade here. At the end. Um, but anyway, um, if, what do you notice about the, the doses here? You know, if you think about like a typical dose like Simvastatin, it's like 20, 40, 80 milligrams. You're dosing this stuff in grams and it comes in this big powder um, and it is, not great from a compliance standpoint because it's very gritty. Um, it's just really nasty to drink out of mixing in water or you know orange juice or something like that just to get it down. So patient compliance is not great. But on a limited systemic exposure, this is kind of the drug class to go with, right? Um, you're going to see here that the GI effects are also going to be pretty um, nasty for the most part. So again, either mix the fruit juice or the water, mix in a pulpy drink. Sometimes that helps to mask some of the gritty nature of it. So if you can mix it with something like um, orange juice with some extra pulp or something, uh, that can be useful, although some people just have a natural aversion to that. And then you wanna take it within an hour of a meal. And you're like, well, why would I wanna take it within an hour of a meal? Well, when are you sending out the most bile salts? Probably when you're trying to digest some fats and whatnot. So this is when it's gonna be most effective. However, it's also gonna bind up a ton of other medications. You have to keep the bile acid sequestered separate from all other medications. Either give your other medications an hour before the bile acid sequestrants or like two to three hours afterwards. So scheduling can be a tough thing with these drugs too, especially if you have a patient that's a pretty extensive medication. Okay. So as I mentioned, not absorbed from the GI tract. And while I say, yeah, almost everything can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, this one's going to be pretty severe from the GI effects. You're going to get bloating and flatulence and fullness and constipation. And I always think it's funny because they say, well, this is like the approved one for pregnancy. And I'm like, well, pregnant patients, what are they experiencing anyway? Bloating, flatulent, fullness. It's like, well, who, who in the heck would want to give that to a pregnant patient? I'd be making them miserable. But again, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. Can they last nine months and have elevated LDL? You know, it's a risk versus benefit sort of analysis there. So you want to be cautious. Um, you can also get some malabsorption of things like vitamins A, D, E, and K and folic acid. All of these are critically important for pregnant patients to get adequate amounts of because the developing fetus does need those. Um, so that can be a problem with those. Interestingly, some other things you can see with this as well is that it may actually increase the LDL production as sort of a secondary effect of it. And so you can actually see a bump in your triglycerides. So while able to lower your LDL, not great from a triglyceride standpoint, so that may be something you want to think about prior to using it. Uh, I have the side effects, and I'm not on any meds at the moment. Well, you know, it's uh, you know, stress can do that for sure. Maybe some, uh, I, I think a lot of cases uh, of irritable bowel syndrome can be uh, uncovered by PA school, um, especially around my test time. So, you know, it just, just is what it is. So hopefully you get some for that. Um, Anyway, you can see some issues with calcium excretion being enhanced because actually this, uh, the resins will bind to calcium and that can lead to you know, worsened things like osteoporosis if your patient really needed that calcium in the first place. A uh, ton of drug interactions, right? It's going to bind up to a ton of other drugs, so things like tajoxin, morphine, um, any kind of thyroid drugs, uh, beta blockers, thiazide diuretics. So you really got to be cautious here. And again, as I mentioned, either one hour before, this, right here, about four hours, usually like two to four hours, I would say, afterwards would be safe. The longer the time you give it afterwards, um, the interacting meds after the bile acid sequestrants, the better off you're gonna be, right? The less chance for absorption you'll have. So in terms of contraindications, obviously if the patient had elevated triglycerides to begin with, you would not wanna give them a bile acid sequestrant because that can only worsen that. So that's be one thing to watch out for. And again, relative, the triglycerides are over 200, you know, again, it's all gonna be sort of on the, uh, a scale there in terms of, what else they're taking? Are those other drugs going to be reducing triglycerides? You know, things like that. Where do we use them? Um, again, they're considered, quote unquote, the safest because they have no systemic side effects. However, um, keep in mind though, all the GI effects you can see there. So maybe someone who has something like inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's or something, that could actually exacerbate that, right? Um, so again, be cautious with these. Usually they're poorly tolerated, not used super frequently. But they could be that alternative 
if you had a very special use case, like a pregnant patient, for instance, right? Okay, uh, up next we have niacin. So niacin is actually a B-complex vitamin. Um, there's some other forms of it too. We most often we'll give it as nicotinic acid, um, used as an anti-lipemic, right? So you're able to get more lipids out of the blood. Um, you may see it also called like niacinamide is another option you may see it called there. Um, however, if you do see niacinamide, this is not gonna be the effect of as an anti-lipemic. So again, you may find some dietary supplements and whatnot contain niacinamide, this is not good for as an anti-lipemic. You want the actual either um, nicotinic acid or, or niacin itself on the label there. Um, this is one's interesting because a lot of it you will find as dietary supplements. So if you had someone who had, you know, concerns about their cholesterol and they wanted to use something more natural, they could do something like this. This would be reasonable uh, for that. It's not going to be as good of an effect as statins by any means. But again, that's a conversation you're having with your patients there. We do have some prescription grade stuff. I'll mention those in just a second here. So um, one of the big things you're gonna run into, and I'll tell you a funny story about this. I, I think it's funny, I don't know, uh, but you're my captive audience, so it is what it is. Um, looking at uh, different formulations of niacin, there's immediate release niacin. So either niacin as a supplement, like dietary supplement, or as the prescription drug called NICOR typically, or you can have long acting formulations. Most of the ones you can find nowadays in terms of dietary supplements will be the long acting forms. And I'll tell you why in a moment here. Um, the extended release one we have available as a prescription is niacin, and then sometimes you may find a version called inositol hexa, hexa niacinate, and that is going to be another dietary supplement you may find that can kind of serve similar purposes as niacin. So what does this do? Well, basically what it helps to do is uh, decrease the amount of free fatty acids um, that are being liberated from adipose tissue, and overall this helps with reducing the amount of triglycerides that get synthesized within the liver. So less VLDL is being made as a result of that. And overall, you're gonna get some decrease in LDL, but the, the other big thing you're gonna find here is that you're gonna have decreased LDL concentration, or VLDL concentration, I should say, so decreased triglycerides, elevated HDL. So you can kind of think about the fibrates and niacin sort of doing similar activities of reducing triglycerides and elevating HDL. Those are the two drug classes that are best at doing those two things there, okay? Another way we can see here is that you're decreasing mobilization of those free fatty acids from the adipose tissue. So overall, decrease triglyceride synthesis, decrease um, VLDL secretion here, which overall will have a, a decent, you know, modest effect lowering LDL. But the big thing here is just increases in HDL, decreases in triglycerides. Okay. So as I mentioned here, um, typically for most patients, you want to use the extended release preparations. So why is that? So niacin has the tendency to increase prostaglandin synthesis, okay? We talked about prostaglandins before. We know that they're important for like platelet function. We know they're important in terms of uh, inflammation. You tend to find that if you have someone taking like regular old immediate release niacin, they get this prostaglandin effect that ends up causing significant vasodilation, right? So what does that vasodilation do, right? Because you'll find the prostaglandins tend to have a vasodilatory effect. That'll be important in the kidneys later when we get to talking about hypertension. What does that mean? Well, basically, um, what you're going to see with that is that you're going to end up having vasodilation leading to increased flushing. Patients are going to feel very hot. They'll feel like feverish almost. Um, you're going to get severe GI upset. They're going to be just like red as a beet, sweating. They're going to feel miserable, right? So how do I know this? How do I have such a vivid picture in my head of what this looks like? Well. Um, when I was on rotations, um, I was in a, uh, I was in Gainesville at the time. I was practicing at a, a family practice clinic. I was doing like a Coumadin clinic kind of deal. Um, but I had a, a roommate who was at a nearby clinic who was also in, in rotations at the same time with me. And so they decided that they were going to do, um, they had a couple students who were there at the clinic. Uh, it was a pretty slow clinic though. So they're kind of bored. And so they decided they wanted to do a niacin challenge. They wanted to see what it was like if you take a bunch of immediate release niacin so they can better counsel their patients, right? So, you know, better learning through direct experimentation on oneself. You know, there's there's a, a certain uh, certain honor to that, I guess. Anyway, so when I went to go pick up that person from the rotation site and they got into the car, they had uh, recently vomited. They were red from head to toe, looked like they had a sunburn. They were sweating and they were just miserable, miserable, miserable. And I go, what in the heck happened? They told me the story. And I said, well, probably serves you right for experimenting on yourself like that. But the same thing can happen to patients. They probably took way too much of it. But um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, science you know, has to be held out. And if you can't do it ethically on your patients, then do it on yourself, I guess. But anyway, so point being is that they um, probably took way too much and that immediate release causes a huge flush of all those prostaglandins. 
leading to those effects there, which is not great for patients. I don't like that either. So instead, what we can do is use extended release preparations that helps to really mitigate that effect throughout the day. And so they don't get the same sort of flushing reaction. So most of the forms you're going to see as a dietary supplement are extended release preparations. And next time you're at the store or something, I, I encourage you to go check that out and you'll see what I'm talking about there. Um, but prescription wise, we can also give them nice band, which is a nice extended release preparation releases throughout a 24 hour period. Right. Um, as I mentioned, the cutaneous flushing, a lot, a lot of it is through prostaglandin synthesis. And so you're just like, well, what can I do about that? What can I do to treat that? Well, Actually, what you can do is pre-treat me. You can actually pre-treat with something like aspirin, right? So aspirin was traditionally used and still can be used to help block that prostaglandin formation. And for patients who are particularly sensitive to all that flushing, aspirin was able to help mitigate that pretty significantly. So if you ever see someone who's taking aspirin in addition to something like niacin, that is why they're trying to prevent that prostaglandin-mediated flushing from um, Again, the GI effects are pretty significant with this one, especially if they're taking immediate release products. And then you can also see some issues in terms of like increased LFT. So there can be some degree of liver damage there, um, elevated glucose levels, uric acid levels. So again, think about your older patients, maybe with um, who are overweight and a history of diabetes and, and uh, gout. This may not be a great drug for them because of the fact that you could exacerbate their gout, right? You could exacerbate their diabetes. Things you want to be watching out for, right? You can decrease glucose tolerance. That is not great for diabetic patients. And frequently, it goes along hand in hand with cardiovascular disease, what diabetes does very frequently. So that's why this again is not going to be like the go-to sort of medication for a lot of these patients here. But it still could be an art, I know a piece of it could be an arrow in your quiver, so to speak. I'm not very good with analogies right now, but um, you know, as, as something that could be useful if you had needed to get triglycerides down, HDLs up, and even if you wanted to use something as a dietary supplement, this is reasonable for that. Okay. So absolute contraindications, chronic liver disease, because you can worsen that. And then in terms of relative um, issues, you know, diabetes, um, you know, if they're under control, if they're on medications for that, or they're under, you know, exercise and diet, and they can fix their diabetes, that way, this won't be that big of an issue. But if they're uncontrolled, and their A1C is like nine and a half, you know, that that's not going to be the best person for niacin, right? Or history of gout, things like that, you really want to be cautious. So other interactions we kind of mentioned um, with statins, again, they can worsen some of the hepatic effects there. So you want to be careful with those. Bile acid sequestrants will bind these up, will bind up niacin in the GI tract. So that helps to limit how effective it's going to be. And then the flushing can actually be enhanced with ethanol too. Um, it has to do with all the acetaldehyde that we talked about that can be formed from the breakdown of ethanol. So it can worsen the flushing and GI effects. And whatnot. Okay. So where do we use this? Again, if we are going to be using this, definitely not as first line therapy, but it could be. Uh, useful as add-on therapy potentially uh, for patients who need some additional boost in their HDL or drops in their triglycerides. And I'll have a table to kind of compare these just a little bit here. And again, you can find combinations of these drugs as well, and that helps to get synergistic um, drops in LDL, increases in HDL, drops in triglycerides. And again, compliance is improved by maxing these together, right? So again, this is some of the benefits here. If you can't get things under control with statins by themselves, then you can add on something else. However, though, we're going to see that the mantra with treatment of hyperlipidemia nowadays is really more focused on getting as intensive of statin therapy as possible. We'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. Okay, so the newest class we have here of uh, medications for hyperlipidemia include the PCSK9 inhibitors, right? So um, this is kind of an interesting new class here, a very novel mechanism. So there's two in this category called alirocumab, evolocumab. Now, of course, I always drive this point home, so you already know what I'm going to say before I say it, but MAB at the end of the name, it's a monoclonal antibody, right? So you already know some of the risks that are inherent to monoclonal antibodies. You worry about risk of anaphylaxis, right? Now, these are actually humanized um, monoclonal antibodies. You can tell because the U is there, so humanized. Um, so risk for anaphylaxis is going to be relatively low, but it's still something you want to educate patients on, right? Um, because they could be taking this at home, right? They can administer sub-Q medications by themselves, no problem. And again, they have to be injectable because of the fact they took this orally. The GI tract would just tear up those proteins just like they would a hamburger or something else, right? But anyway, what do they do? Well, they target this protein called PCSK9. And basically what PCSK9 does is it's responsible for helping to process and metabolize LDL receptors. So by blocking this protein, it prevents the breakdown of LDL receptors and keeps more of them on the cell surface for longer, which means more of them on the cell surface, more of them can then suck up LDL out of the bloodstream, get those LDL concentrations down. You can see here pretty significant drops, right? So it's injectable only, 
Obviously, it's going to be very expensive, even if it wasn't brand name. Protein-based medications are expensive, right? And then, again, hypersensitivity is going to be a risk here. So, and actually, it's interesting, I didn't put a, a slide about this, but um, one of the side effects they noted in clinical trials for the PCSK9 inhibitors was uh, undetectable LDL. It actually was so effective at some patients getting their LDL down, uh, they couldn't even measure it in the blood anymore. And so one of the, the things they stated was, well, we actually don't know if that's a problem or not. We don't know if this is really a side effect, but this is what we saw one time. And that's the thing you'll see with drug trials too, is that any adverse effect that gets reported from a patient, even if it's not related to the drug, still gets reported on package inserts and drug references and whatnot. So that's why everything causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, because someone probably reported it during the clinical trials, right? Even if it was because they had bad, you know, Mexican food the day before or something, right? Or any kind of food. So anyway, so uh, very interesting set of drugs, again, very expensive, would be beneficial if patients like needed LDL lowering, but they could not take a statin by any re for whatever reason, maybe due to hepatic disease or something else. But these um, are really the newest out of the bunch, but also we won't, don't want to necessarily jump to these unless we have a really good reason to, because it's going to be expensive. So kind of looking at a general comparison here, um, and again, don't memorize these specific numbers here. I'm not going to ask you what, what percentage is resins increase HDL. Like, I don't really care if you know that. What I want you to know are kind of the broad strokes, right? Know that statins are going to have a pretty good job at being able to drop total cholesterol, LDL. They'll raise HDL a little bit and drop down your triglycerides, right? Know that if you need additional drops in your triglycerides and increases in HDL, what two categories are you going to go with? Well, I'm probably going to go with nicotinic acid. I'm probably going to go with one of the fibrates, right? Um, know the drug interactions here. Know the contraindications. Know how the mechanisms are working here. Know if I could mix which two of these drugs that I mix together to get synergistic actions here, right? Those are the things I want you to kind of key in on uh, when we're talking about these. Now, how do you actually measure cholesterol? Um, total cholesterol is just really a um, combination of your HDL, your VLDL, and then your LDL together. But we don't actually directly measure VLDL when you get a lipid panel. And so you measure triglycerides, though. And so actually the way to convert that is if triglycerides are less than 400, just do TG triglycerides divided by 5. Um, so that's how you end up getting that. Um, again, I'm not going to ask you to calculate this on a test. I just want to give you an idea of like how we're actually measuring this stuff and where some of these values are really coming from. And so the old days, what we used to do, so back in my day when I was in school, this is what we did. Um, but we, we learned that basically you had certain LDL cutoffs that you wanted to shoot for. So for instance, you'd say, well, it's optimal to have LDL less than 100. You know, we want HDL greater than 60. You know, uh, if it's less than 40, then we definitely want to try to bump that up. Total cholesterol less than 200. Triglycerides less than 150. That's all well and good. You can get the numbers down, but um, it didn't really speak so much to um, all the additional benefits you really get from statins. So what do we do nowadays? Nowadays, what we're trying to do is we're, we don't care what the cholesterol is, right? Because the cholesterol is really kind of incidental to the, the actual problem, which is the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, right? This is what's killing people. So we want to reduce this risk as much as possible. So how are we going to do that? And statins are going to be playing a big role here. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to base, um, base off patients' risks, based off their current disease states or their 10-year risk for developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we're going to initiate them on some intensity of statin, whether it's moderate intensity or high intensity, based off how they fall into these categories. I'm going to show you in just a moment here. So instead of trying to shoot for a specific LDL target, instead what we're trying to do is shoot for the most intensive therapy that patient can tolerate because we know that the more statins are on within reason, the better effects are going to have in terms of reducing risk of cardiovascular death, right? And developing further atherosclerotic disease, okay? Talking a lot today. So atherosclerosis is a very difficult word to say when your tongue is going to get a little tired here. But regardless, I'll try to soldier on. Um, so again, don't shoot for a specific LDL target. Oftentimes, though, you're still going to be measuring uh, serum lipids because it can actually help you to um, determine compliance, right? So if I have a patient who I knew baseline, their you know their LDL was like 200, and I put them on like 40 versuvastatin, and they come back and it's like 195, I know they're not taking it, right? Because statins are too good at what they do for that level to not have moved at all, right? Maybe there's something else going on, but chances are a patient's not taking that medication. So compliance can be useful to check when you're looking at the LDL levels there, right? What are the four main categories of people that we have discovered benefits with statins? And again, this is coming from 
huge large scale studies like the Framingham Heart Study and things like that. This is where we come up with this information and why we have these numbers, right? So any individual with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, they have angina, they have history of MI, um, you know, things like that. Those are going to be people that are going to be most likely to benefit. It's pretty obvious because they already have existing disease. So yes, this will help them. If they have an LDL greater than 190, they also receive big benefits here. If they have diabetes, because we know diabetes is also uh, one of the major things that lead up to cardiovascular disease as well. And they're between the ages of 40 and 75 and their LDLs between 70 and 189 without ASCVT. So they haven't, they've had diabetes for a while and their LDL, most patients are gonna be somewhere within this range, but they haven't developed cardiovascular disease yet. Um, it's just a matter of time. So this is why they're targeting these people so heavily is because we know they're taking time bombs, so to speak, is so we wanna make sure we go ahead and get them treated early, okay? Then if they didn't have diabetes, um, so without ASCVD or diabetes, and they have LDLs within the range of most individuals are gonna be at, and they have an estimated 10 year risk of greater than 7.5% of developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Those patients can all, right? Let me get into more detail on what that kind of means. And so this is what, I actually just took this from up to date just like last week, I think. So this is the algorithm for the management of elevated low density lipoprotein cholesterol in, in adults without cardiovascular disease. So what are you gonna see here? So imagine you, know, you measure the LDL uh, concentration there and you're evaluating for other risk factors and seeing what their past medical history is and all of that. And so first off, your, your first cut point is, well, is the LDL greater than 190? If you say yes, then yeah, they're probably gonna need uh, some further treatment here. So again, looking at whether or not they have familial hypercholesterolemia, whether it's a genetic thing or not, but let's assume it's not. Let's just say they just have idiopathic high LDL concentrations here. They're automatically gonna start them off a high intensity statin therapy, okay? I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment in terms of like relative doses and things. Um, but let's say no, they, they don't meet that, that cutoff point here. Well, now they wanna go ahead and calculate that 10 year risk. And I'll show you what, that, what goes into that calculation just a little bit here. And if it's greater than 10%, but they don't have any history of diabetes, no history of heart disease, and you go ahead and start them off on moderate dose uh, statins here, um, you know, it's five to 10%, then maybe you, or maybe to like discuss starting a stat, maybe you just talk about them and talk about getting their diet under control here. If it's less than 5%, then you do your typical patient education here, right? And based off how they're responding here, you know, did they get a good drop in their LDL? Did they drop at 30 to 50% or so? Um, if not, again, on moderate intensity statin, you should be able to get a pretty big drop in your LDL. You need to evaluate for compliance. Otherwise, you consider uh, the statin there and then you kind of keep evaluating them, seeing how the risk goes up and whatnot uh, over time. So. Again, find out if your patient falls into one of these categories and figure out what kind of intensity of statin they're really going to need. Okay, so what are those risk factors that go into this? And you can do it for yourself if you wanted to. But um, so this is from you know MedCalc uh, or ClinCalc.com. You can go and find this anywhere if you just Google it. Um, but as an example here, you could type in uh, print the patient's gender, male or female. Obviously, we know males are going to be more prone to cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, we have this wimpy Y chromosome that just doesn't protect us like a nice X would do. Uh, patient's age. Put in their race, put in total cholesterol, HDL. You know, HDL is actually protective, so the lower this number is, the worse that would be for your risk. Put in the systolic blood pressure. If they're on treatment for high blood pressure, if they're diabetic, or if they are a smoker. And you calculate that and you get that risk. And if it's greater than 7.5%, then yeah, they're going to need some statin there. Okay. So you can actually break that down, and you can see that not all statins are really built equally right some of them are just better at what they do than others and so this is why um, when i'm asking questions and whatnot i kind of primarily focus on three of them i talk about rosuvastatin atorvastatin and simvastatin right why those three well atorvastatin and rosuvastatin because they are the most potent ones that we have right rosuvastatin by far is the most potent if you see here looking at equivalent dosages 20 milligrams of rosuvastatin is equivalent to about a dose of 40 milligrams of atorvastatin, right? Showing that, you know, rosuvastatin is the most potent, right? You have the most room to go up on this, get really good management of their, their cholesterol there. So these two would be considered good enough to get LDL reduced by more than 50%, okay? If you didn't see this drop, then they're probably not taking the med, right, for whatever reason. Uh, for moderate intensity, you have a lot more options that are here. I'll focus on simvastatin because this one is probably been around the longest, um, I don't know if it's the longest, but it's one I see used sort of the most frequently out of the bunch here. It is the one that's probably the cheapest. You'll find it like on uh, a lot of free medication lists, or if you go to like Walmart, you can find it on the very cheap medication list. Um, so it's available, right? So a lot of patients may start on this because it's just the most widely available and cheapest to get a hold of. 
that they need a more high intensity is you can't drive up the dose of simvastatin high enough without putting them at undue risk for hepatic toxicity, for myotoxicity, and all of that. So that's why you got to be able to use high intensity statins if need be. That's only going to include atorvastatin and rituximab. Okay? Remember which one of these is going to miss those CYP3-4 interactions, right? Rituximab. That's the one that if you absolutely had to start someone on a statin, you could not get rid of other CYP3-4 inhibiting drugs. Rituximab is a drug to go with. Okay. Especially if you need a high intensity statin therapy there. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, so again, you want to select the appropriate dose based off what the recommendations are from the guidelines, keeping in mind all the drug interactions and all the side effects you're going to monitor for, and then you see what they can tolerate. If they can't tolerate the maximum dose that's recommended by the guidelines, then you scale it back to see what they can tolerate. Okay. Um, once you figure out what that happy medium spot is and you keep them at that, and then see how they do, right? So just make sure you're getting the drops in LDL to show compliance and all of that, and then that's the dose wrong. Anyway, so that's it for this section. I still have about half an hour to go, so I'm glad I was able to get through that. This is a pretty meaty section here, uh, section two of the class, so I do want to make sure that I can get started on some of our cardiology stuff here. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of this one, see if we have some, oh, we have some questions. on. Answers are, um, if you have too much fat in your diet, we get hormonal issues like excess hormone. That's a complicated question. Um, you know, I think that um, the fat itself may not be so much of the problem because remember, um, you know, going back and maybe someone like Shelby can correct me if I'm wrong here, but, um, you know, fat is not necessarily the thing that makes you fat, right? It's a lot of times it's carbohydrates and things like that that get stored, excess glucose and whatnot gets stored as adipose tissue and fat and all of that, um, all of which have an effect on hormones and whatnot. Your genetics have a huge role to play in this. But certainly when you look at things like uh, patients with like PCOS, right, who, um, you know, typically they tend to be more overweight, they tend to be hyper uh, adrenergic, you know, producing things like testosterone and, and whatnot. Yeah, it's so excess carbohydrates are the, the biggest offender there. But um, it's there's so many different factors that go into it, including your genetics, it's hard to say that you'd necessarily get one hormonal issue over another for instance. Certainly hormones in terms of like insulin, you're definitely going to run some issues with that for sure. So um that's a complicated question. I don't have the best answer to. Uh, sorry about that. Um, is there an increased risk of bleeding with fluvastatin if you're taking warfarin? Um, with that one, um, not necessarily. I mean, you just have to monitor for it, right? So it'd be one of those things there where if you started them on both, I don't know that necessarily you'd run into too many issues. Now, what if, for instance, you were having them on any statin for that matter, and they started to develop hepatotoxicity? One of the big things you'll see, and this is kind of something I'd never realized until um, I was out and I was actually practicing, is that when you think about liver function tests, you measure those ALTs and ASTs. That's not telling you whether the liver's functioning or not. What it's telling you is are your liver cells dying off to where they're expressing these enzymes and you can measure them in the blood, right? Because they should be in the phatocytes where you can't measure them. Um, the bigger thing to tell of actual liver function is like, can the patient produce clotting factors? Um, you'll see this a lot, especially with like patients with fulminant hepatic failure. I see this most with patients with severe Tylenol ingestions where the liver is starting to fail on them. You'll start to see the INR go up because they can't produce those clotting factors that would be necessary um, to be able to clot normally, right? Because we mentioned most clotting factors are made in the liver. So that's how I tell liver function. So yeah, could you have someone who got severe hepatotoxicity from something like fluvastatin? that affected the warfarin they're on? Yeah, for sure, right? So that's that could be a risk, but otherwise I would just say monitor for it. Look to see if you notice any new uh, bleeding or bruising, either from the gums or bruising the skin, things like that you can monitor for uh, at home. All right, this may be a little bit random, but do you know of any weird interactions between turmeric and statins? That's a good question. You know what we can do? We can look it up, right? I got time. Let's do, uh, let's see, let's go to Lexicomp. And we're going to log in here, use my Memores account, and let's see, we can do drug interaction, okay? Let's find out, because again, I don't know as much about, um, uh, you know, things like uh, dietary supplements as probably as I could, but we can look it up. Let's see if this comes up in here. Oh my goodness, it doesn't show up anything. Hmm, that's a good question. Well, what else could we do? We can play. Turmeric and statins, what do you use? Uh, turmeric and statins should be used cautiously. Let's find out what this source is. Let's see if it's a good source or not. Oh my goodness, it's a Word document. I don't know if I want to download that. It's probably a, got some kind of a virus associated with it. But you know, you can tell here looking at this. Um, Turmeric, did I spell it wrong? 
Oh my goodness. Oh, it's turmeric. Is it really turmeric? I didn't realize that. I always said turmeric for the longest time. Uh, yeah, this is coming from the National Health uh, Service over in the UK. So I would probably uh, think that it could be a worthwhile um, source there. Let's see. Anyways, I don't want to get too lost. Uh, and yeah, I just learned something new. I learned how to spell turmeric for the first time. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, it looks like there might be some interaction here. I have to do some more digging, but I don't want to take away from your learning any further there. So I do like random questions though for the most part, but usually only the ones I know the answers to. Those are my favorite random questions. Anyway, let's switch back over to our next section. This is what I do know a lot about, blood pressure meds. So I'm gonna get started here um, with our first class. Again, you can tell this is a bit of a beefy PowerPoint here. There's gonna be a lot of new drugs in, in this category. So sit back and enjoy the ride. We'll probably get through our um, diuretics here and then we'll, we'll cover the rest of it next time. We, so um, let's talk about diuretics. Hopefully no one has to go to the bathroom or you can just pause me if you want to and, and do that. This may make you need to go. Um, so what do our diuretics do, right? They make you urinate more. How does it do that? Well, the basic gist of it is, is you're gonna find that urine flow is gonna increase by helping uh, or by it uh, happens by excreting more sodium and fluoride for that matter. So a general rule of thumb is, and this kind of applies to a lot of different spaces within the body, but where salt goes, water follows, right? And that makes sense if you think about things like, you know, um, osmosis, anything about tonicity and things like that. Remember you uh, probably in physiology you saw how like cells can swell or they can crenate based off of um, solute content and things like that. Well, that all has to do with osmosis and where the solute is going to be lying here. And essentially what we're going to do is that within the renal tubules, we're going to increase the salt and the chloride content and water is going to follow that. And that's eventually going to be treated as urine. Okay. Now we can't do this to the extreme edge because of the fact that if we have uh, a balance here and a uh, imbalance here between salt intake and loss, that's fatal, right? We need sodium to live, to have normal functioning neurons and muscles and things like that. Um, and we need to be able to get rid of fluid effectively as well. So you have to strike this balance here. You know, too much fluid, you have volume overload, you get pulmonary edema. There are patients with like CHF have a hard time getting rid of excess fluids, build up on the, on the lungs and elsewhere. Too little, obviously we're gonna get volume depletion. Your blood volume is gonna go down. You got nothing to fill the hose to speak. So pressure goes down cardiovascular collapse, right? So obviously we must strike a balance. How do we do that? Well, kidneys are super, super important for doing that. So kidneys are critical in helping us to regulate blood pressure, blood volume, salt control, all of these things here. Very, very important. We're talking about all the different hormones that help to affect this, okay? So again, if you never um, uh, you know, understood how uh, important and complex the kidneys are, just you wait for the renal section in CMS and just you wait for um, you talk about kidney stuff now and then later on. They're they're pretty amazing little organs there, uh, given their size. Um, and again, looking at this, you know, they get about 22% of cardiac output, right? These are like 7% of the oxygen in the body, even though they only make up like a half a percent of your body weight. So very metabolically active, very important for all of the um, different uh, transport proteins that are functioning, all of that to make sure that we can regulate what we're filtering and what we're eventually excreting out, okay? Now, we're gonna also find there's a lot of hormones that are gonna be affecting the kidneys additionally. So things like uh, the renin angiotensin system, that's gonna be extremely important when we get into talking about some of our other medications for blood pressure, right? Um, we're gonna see as well that the kidneys have a lot of compensatory mechanisms to make sure that they prevent volume depletion, cardiovascular collapse, meaning that they can detect when there's not enough pressure, when there's not enough salt and not enough fluid, such that they can go ahead and inhibit how much urine they're producing in order to keep blood volume up and keep pressure up. So this is where things like the sympathetic nervous system will come into play, the renin angiotensin, aldosterone system, um, blood pressure itself will can play a role here, atrial natriuretic peptide, antidiuretic hormone, all these things here are really, really important in the compensatory mechanisms for the kidneys. We'll get into all of this, don't you worry. If you don't know what all these things are doing, we will talk about it ad nauseum. You actually vomit from how much you're gonna learn about this stuff, right? So anyway, talking about the kidney itself, obviously we know the general anatomy of the kidney, assuming you remember your stuff from anatomy in, in uh, the summer, basically. But we remember that the nephron is sort of the basic functional unit of the kidney itself, right? So blood flow is going to come into the glomerulus. It'll Some stuff will get filtered out. It'll go through our proximal convoluted tubule, 
down into the loop of Henley. John Henley, but I don't know which who the Henley was that was named after. But it'll go into the distal convoluted tubule and then down into the collecting tubule where it can eventually be treated out through and uh, into the bladder and then out through the urinary tract, right? So we're going to see that we have medications that work at all portions of or different portions of the uh, nephron here. We're going to see that um, depending on where they're working at, they're going to have relative um, differences in their efficacy of getting rid of salt and water. Uh, we're going to see that things like, for instance, that work in the loop, uh, loop of Henle are going to be much more potent than things that work, for instance, at the proximal convoluted tubule, for instance. Okay, so we're going to figure out what all these different hormones are doing, all these different drugs are doing in order to help us regulate salt and water flow. So let us go through the different portions of the nephron so that we can have a better understanding of sort of what's happening at each spot so that way we can understand where our drugs are going to be interacting, right? So let's go over the, the natural physiology here. So talking about the glomerulus right away, right? So into Bowman's capsule, we have some blood flow coming in. Remember at the uh, glomerulus, you have all those little fenestrations in the vessels there, which allows for things to be freely filtered. And you get about 16 to 20% of filter, uh, fluid and solutes being filtered here. That means glucose is coming through, amino acids, um, all kinds of electrolytes, bicarb. This is really important because we know that the kidneys are very important for sort of long-term control of um, acid-base balance, right? And you can filter about 150 to 100 liters a day. Of that, though, a lot of it's going to get reabsorbed, right? That's important because if you were to excrete 180 liters, you would probably be a human piece of jerky, I guess. Um, only about one to two liters actually get excreted, though. So, again, you're filtering the plasma like 50 to 60 times a day, which is why it's so important to get rid of a lot of waste products and things like that. So moving then into the proximal tubule, this is where you get the lion's share of reabsorption happening here. So most of the filtrate that gets filtered through the glomerulus all gets just reabsorbed right away into the proximal convoluted tubule here. This means a lot of your glucose gets reabsorbed here, amino acids, organic solutes, all those things here, okay? Um, some things though can be excreted into the lumen, right? You can have some things that get filtered or uh, actually just pass through the glomerulus that can't be filtered and they'll be excreted into the proximal convoluted tubule. So some things will get reabsorbed, some things will get excreted. This can include medications too, as we'll see a little bit later on, right? But most of the filtrate gets reabsorbed here, right? Uh, which is important too, because like you can overload these re um, uh, reabsorption processes too. So for instance, someone with like diabetes who's extremely hyperglycemic, they can filter out all this glucose, but they can't reabsorb it because they're um, occupying all of those uh, transporters and then it just gets eliminated through the kidney or uh, through the urine, right? That's why you can actually measure glucose in the urine there when they've kind of overloaded that. Same thing with proteins and whatnot. So down into the loop of Henley, and you can see kind of the relative amount of sodium and water being reabsorbed to each of these portions here. And so you're going to find that the loop of Henley is extremely important for helping us to concentrate urine through things like uh, sodium reabsorption. So I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the term like the countercurrent multiplier, things like that. And based on how um, long that loop of Henle is and how far it projects into the kidney, um, how that can help us to concentrate um, the urine even more. Um, there's kind of like a maximum concentration that we can get in terms of like milliosms per liter of urine. And it's kind of interesting too, I've always found it was neat. Um, there's like a, um, uh, an animal, there's a, it's like a kangaroo mouse or something that lives in the desert. And their loops of Henley are extremely long and they allowed them to get a concentration of their urine of like, you know, a couple thousand milliatoms per liter because they want to hold on to all that water as much as they can because they live in the desert, right? Um, but us, on the other hand, that we can only have limited concentrating abilities and most of that happens here in the loop of Henley. Most of the sodium is getting reabsorbed here in the ascending loop, right? So it kind of, is kind of going in this direction, going down the loop. Most water is going to be reabsorbed or a lot of water will be reabsorbed here, but the salt gets reabsorbed at this point here the ascending loop. And this is where what we're going to talk about our loop diuretics is actually where that's going to work there. So anyway, so we have that and then um, loop diuretics work here very potent in terms of what they do very good at getting rid of a lot of salt and a lot of water. Okay. Then we're going to get into the distal convoluted tubule here. Here you're not going to see a ton of salt being reabsorbed normally. Uh, but this is where you can start to see things like aldosterone playing a role here. Aldosterone is a little bit more important in the collecting duct as well. But you kind of start to see a little bit of it, uh, receptors being expressed here. Um, but this is where our thiazide diuretics are going to work. So if you ever heard of like HCTZ, or actually I had one patient called Huctaz one time, didn't realize it was an acronym. Um, but, uh, you know, thiazide diuretics are going to be working here at this point. This will be really important for blood pressure control, as we'll see in a little bit. And then the collecting duct. This is where we're going to see that the primary um, influencers here 
uh, at least from an endocrine standpoint, are going to be aldosterone and then ADH or antidiuretic hormone. We're going to see both of those are going to help us to reabsorb uh, water. Both of them will do water, but then um, ADH is specific just for helping to reabsorb water. Aldosterone is more so helping to reabsorb salt and then some water to go along with that. This is where a lot of our potassium sparing diuretics are going to be working as a result of the effects of aldosterone. So kind of keep that in mind as well. So we're going to see how all these are going to be working together, how our medications are going to be affecting them. So I always find this stuff super interesting. So do I get kind of uh, a little geeked out about it, I guess, um, or nerd out about it. Uh, so anyway, getting to the loop diuretics here. So let's talk about these because we're kind of going in order from sort of most potent diuretics to least potent. Um, and so what we're, you know, we're kind of talking about hypertension more broadly here, as we'll see in a little bit. But um, loop diuretics are actually not great antihypertensive drugs. Um, we're going to see the thighs eyes are going to be much more effective at treating blood pressure. Uh, than the loop diuretics are. Loop diuretics, though, they are very good at getting rid of excess fluid. So if you got some with fluid overload, give them a loop diuretic and they will urinate quite a bit, right? So how does that work, though? So looking at this, uh, uh, the nephron here, looking at the renal tubule, here you have the luminal side and you have where urine actually is, right? So this is where the filtrate is going through the loop of Henle. Here you're going to have the interstitium uh, where the blood is, right? And remember, a lot of the nephron itself is sort of uh, enveloped almost like a web of all these capillaries and whatnot. So there's a lot of blood flow right adjacent to the renal tubule. So it makes sense of where there's this flow here between the urine and the blood, how you can have excretion of some things, reabsorption, makes good sense there. Anyway, so what are we going to do? Well, normally what happens in the ascending loop of Henle is you're going to have reabsorption of sodium, uh, but also there's a transporter here that's really important. It reabsorbs sodium, potassium, and then it gets two chlorides. So it's kind of equaling each other out in the sense of charge here. We're going to reabsorb this. It's then going to uh, have an active transporter. It's requiring ATP here. That's why kidneys take so much oxygen up, because they have a lot of ATP-dependent transporters. They're going to bring in a lot of sodium. Okay, They're going to be sucking the sodium back into the bloodstream. The potassium, though, again, this is a sodium-potassium pump. It's going to be bringing in potassium into the cell here. So as a result of that, you have kind of a buildup of potassium. They're going to have an efflux that happens here that, to balance out, will allow for things like magnesium and calcium to be reabsorbed in order to keep the balance here with the charges and whatnot. So what that's going to do for us is basically <clears throat> we're going to see that um, by affecting this, not only do you affect sodium and water, but we also have a strong effect on potassium. We're going to affect magnesium, and we're going to affect calcium. So a lot of uh, electrolyte disorders can be induced or potentially treated by loop diuretics. We're going to look at that in a second. So a lot of the side effects will be related to the electrolyte shift that can happen here. So what do loop diuretics do? Well, they're going to shut off this transporter. Shut off the sodium, potassium, chloride transporter here. Shut it down. So what does that do? Well, that means there's a buildup of sodium, potassium here in the luminal side of the urine. And so what follows all that salt? Well, water goes along with it. And so because of that, you're able to basically prevent the urine from becoming as concentrated as it wanted to be, and you're getting it much more dilute. You bring all this water along with it, and then you can eliminate that as urine. Very, very potent what they do. Um, again, you're going to be losing, though, calcium with it. You're going to be losing potassium, losing magnesium with it. So a lot of electrolytes being lost when you're using a uh, loop diuretic. There's four that fit into this category. There's furosemide or Lasix, which I think most people have probably heard of. Um, if anyone wants to know why they call it Lasix, because it lasts about six hours of so Lasix. Um, there's Bumetanide or Bumax, there's Torsamide or Demodex, and then kind of the oddball out here is Ethicrinic Acid or Edicrine. Ethicrinic Acid kind of got its um, use for a while because a lot of people thought that if you had a sulfa allergy, you'd have a reaction to a lot of these other ones like Bumetanide and Furosemide. Um, so you could use this safely in patients with sulfa allergies. I don't know if that's necessarily true anymore, but you know that's what it's claimed to fame for a while. Yeah, everyone in the ICU is either on Lasix or Bumex, right? and that makes a good sense because most of them are probably on IV fluids. Most of them are not getting up and walking around, so they got a lot of like venous stasis, and that fluid just kind of sits there. And so, yeah, so a lot of people need that extra help to get rid of the fluids by using some of these um, uh, medications here, either IV, PO, via drip, and whatever the case may be. So what are the actions here? Majorly, we're going to see that we're going to be inhibiting sodium and chloride reabsorption by about 20 to 25 percent. So whereas we saw that like one to two liters of urine are produced a day, we can bump that up to about four liters per day. You can double the amount of urine that you're producing there, which is pretty significant. As I mentioned, you're going to see more potassium excretion, calcium, and magnesium excretion. So if you have someone who is already hypokalemic or hypocalcemic or hypomagnesemic, 
you got to watch for this because that can really aggravate a lot of things like um, uh, you know muscle function. It can aggravate things like uh, arrhythmias and whatnot. So you got to be cautious with this because you know it's going to happen. You know they're going to leach out those electrolytes. You got to replace it, right? Can you cause hyponatremia like this? Maybe, but it's not as common as you might think. It's all these other electrolytes who really leach out uh, to a significant degree. So what are some actions here um, caused by this? So the kidneys don't necessarily like to be knocked out of homeostasis, right? Everything likes to stay kind of chill. Everyone likes to just stay right where they're at, you know, um, not have any big changes, right? People hate change. So does your body. And so what's going to happen is by inducing this amount of urine being released uh, or being uh, excreted, you're going to cause a lot of reflex mechanisms, okay? This reflex mechanism include things like... Um, uh, the sympathetic nervous system because they're gonna the kidneys are just saying hey wait a second we're losing a lot of fluid here pressure might go down some and they're gonna have that response of saying well let's get that blood pressure back up release some norepinephrine right gonna do a lot of other things too than just affect the blood pressure as we'll see here in just a little bit so what is this gonna do well basically we're gonna see other actions here it can cause hyperglycemia one of reason why is because we can see that hypokalemia itself by leaching out that potassium Due to loop diuretics, you can impair insulin release, right? You need potassium in order to release insulin. Missing that, it can be an issue, right? So it'd be bad for diabetic patients. Um, you can have reflex-mediated catecholamine release. That's the thing I was talking about, that reflex mechanism there, where you can see where alpha-2 um, agonism can actually decrease insulin release in and of itself. But also the other big thing too is that if you have beta receptors in the liver being activated, this induces glycogenolysis, which causes gluconeogenesis to take place, which releases blood sugar, out into the bloodstream. So now you're not only you're decreasing insulin release, but you're upping the blood sugar being released from the, the liver, right? Not great. Um, you also have some systemic vasodilator actions. These we don't always understand. Some of it may be related to prostaglandins. Um, this is more of a minor effect you can see with this, but the glyce hyperglycemia thing, more so is gonna be more pronounced in diabetic patients and you know most you know healthy individuals without diabetes, they can sort of overcome this due to their own homeostatic mechanisms, but it's something you may wanna watch out for. Other things you're going to find, as a result of this reflex mechanism, the kidneys detecting a loss of sodium in the macula densa, right? Remember those juxtaglomerular cells you have down there? They're going to say, wait a sec, we don't have enough salt here anymore. Let's go ahead and try to get, um, hold on to more salt. Let's try to hold on to more water here. And so that upregulates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We'll talk about this extensively a little bit later on. When the renin angiotensin system gets upregulated, aldosterone is going to be affecting the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule, antidiuretic hormones also going to be uh, expressed uh, from the pituitary to cause us to hold on to more water, right? Also increases that salt thirst, right? Or that um, that need for um, taking in water and salt. Uh, you know, it's so funny. I remember, uh, I don't know if I told you guys a story before, but if you've ever uh, seen a patient with SIADH before, it's uh, something called syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Uh, basically, they can either have that due to like, a brain tumor or head trauma or drugs can induce this but i've never seen anyone in my life so thirsty as someone with siadh it was really kind of wild because i was rotating in the surgical icu and a patient had a head trauma in a, due to um, a motor vehicle accident and came in and they were you know recovering but you know they they had this siadh so we were tr really trying to monitor their sodium and their water intake and they were on on heavy water restriction right and so um you know, the patient was like, well, can I just get some Gatorade or something? I'm just so thirsty. I'm so thirsty. And we're like, no, you can't have any. Um, so what did she do? Well, she tried to sneak out on her own to the cafeteria uh, to get some. She got caught, so she couldn't leave her room. I uh, had someone watch her. Um, she tried to bribe family members to go down to the cafeteria because she just wanted some Gatorade. She couldn't get any because it was a SIDH. It's a really strong hormonal effect you can see um, as a result of this. So, again, that's another thing you'll see is not only does it affect water reabsorption in the kidneys, but you're gonna see it's also gonna cause you from a brain standpoint to want to get more water and salt into your system from an oral standpoint. Yeah, it's pretty awful. It was um, you know, resolved on its own after time, but it's like, that's the best treatment for it is fluid restriction, unfortunately, and, and um, but ultimately end up resolving on its own. But anyway, um, yeah, so sip your water if you're thirsty. But um, also uric acid, you're gonna find um, decreased excretion. And as a result of that, you're gonna hold on to more plasma uric acid, which means patients with gout, and that can be exacerbated, right? You can actually end up leading to a gout exacerbation as a result of uric acid buildup there. A lot of it has to do with not only that you're um, increasing reabsorption and you're decreasing the excretion, but also as you lose body volume, blood volume, you're concentrating everything that's there so that uric acid becomes more concentrated. 
you know, something like that in Grey's Anatomy, you drink from the toilet. I would not be surprised. Uh, I've seen patients do some pretty wild things. Uh, I've seen some alcoholic patients use hand sanitizer on their Jello to get the little foamy stuff on there. But, uh, you know, patients will always surprise you. Um, other things you can find here, you can find that, uh, mild metabolic alkalosis. A lot of this has to do with volume depletion, concentrating uh, bicarb in the, um, in the blood, and some enhanced hydrogen ion secretion. So mild increase in pH from a systemic standpoint. You find hyperlipidemia can actually be worsened by this. Um, and not only that, but also we're going to find this blocking some of the transporters in the macula densa. And that can help to affect that feedback loop that we mentioned before that regulates things like angiotensin 2 and GFR. Don't worry about this too much. We're going to talk about this uh, much more in greater degree later on. We get into the RAS drugs in a little bit. Um, the other thing, too, that's really important with loop diuretics is they remain effective even if you have really poor kidney function. So even if your kidney function is like less than 30 mLs a minute, and keep in mind normal is like around 100 mLs a minute, these will still work, right? So even if you have someone who is in renal failure, you can still give them a loop diuretic, and chances are they're going to end up producing some kind of urine, okay? doesn't mean the kidneys are functioning any better. It just means that they are um, not reabsorbing all that water and salt like they were before. So what do we use this for? And again, it's not great for hypertension in and of itself because all those reflex mechanisms bring the pressure back right up to where it was before or even a little bit higher. So what do we do this for? Well, typically, it's in order to get rid of extra fluids. If you have edema of any type, whether it be peripheral, pulmonary, if you have ascites, and, you know, fluid building up as a result of um, hepatic dysfunction, nephrotic syndrome, all these things help us to get rid of that extra fluid there. Heart failure, renal failure, all of that, right? So if you want to get rid of extra fluid, loop diuretics are the best way to do it. That's maybe like dialysis or something, but loop diuretics a little bit more, um, less invasive, I'll say. A lot of adverse effects, of so many of which we've already talked about. We talked about the hyperglycemia, hypokalemia, and actually, too, you also have to worry about things like ototoxicity, right? So if you have really high levels of loop diuretics, that can actually damage the hair cells in the cochlea, just like we saw with things like vancomycin, mean glycosides, and, and whatnot. Um, and also you worry about some allergic reactions. A lot of it has to do with a lot of the sulfonamide, moieties that are present on things like Lasix and, and um, Humetanide and Torsamide, not present though on ethochronic acid. So someone who has like a true Lasix allergy, something like ethochronic acid could be used as an alternative, potentially, okay? But we kind of talked about all those points there. In terms of like drug interactions, the biggest thing you're gonna see is that um, with one, NSAIDs are gonna be a big problem in terms of blood pressure control, in terms of the natriuretic effect. Natriuretic just means urinating sodium. Um, we'll talk more about that at greater degree a little bit later on. We'll get, we'll get into that later. Um, aminoglycosides, really anything potentiating ototoxicity, that could be worse. So if I had someone on Vanco, Gentamicin, and Lasix, Lasix drip, that could be really uh, spell problems for their ears and their hearing. And if they're intubated and sedated, they can't tell you that, hey, my hearing's kind of muffled all of a sudden. I can't really hear very much. That can be an issue there. Sometimes you can interact with warfarin due to plasma binding, binding interactions there. So you'd want to watch out for an extra bleeding with that. Um, and then, especially with drugs like lithium, we can find that actually can lead to accumulation of the drug. We'll talk all about that in behavioral health next uh, next semester. And then drugs like digoxin, which actually we'll get into in this semester in a couple lectures. Um, anytime you're on a medication for arrhythmias, if you start messing around with electrolytes, you're increasing your risk for more arrhythmias. So due to hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, you can really increase your risk for issues of uh, arrhythmia due to some of these other anti um, antiarrhythmic medications, which is kind of funny because the fact that all antiarrhythmic drugs can cause arrhythmia. It's kind of counterintuitive, but we'll see why that is in a couple lectures here. So that is it for the loop diuretics. I will stop here because I'm out of time, um, but then we can talk about the thiazides coming up next, and this will be really important in terms of treatment for hypertension. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind, and we'll hit on that next. Uh, let me see if there's any questions. Hopefully it's not more spelling of, uh, or corrections of my spelling of spices. Uh, okay, we talked about that one. What are anionic exchange resins? That was the bile acids question that we talked about. Basically, it's a, a resin where it's able to exchange one ion, uh, anion for another. And so basically, it's usually bound to things like salt maybe, for instance. And it can exchange that and bind to like a bile salt instead. So bind to the bile salt and then that can be eliminated through the GI tract. So that's essentially what they're kind of talking about. Uh, if you ever see like Delsum, Delsum is an anti-tussive agent with um, dextromethorphan in it. That also is an extended release product that's an anion exchange resin. That's why it has a long duration of action because it slowly kind of releases um, the dextromethorphan throughout the day. What other questions do you guys have? Before I let you all go.
If um, so, I only see forty people on here. Remember, these are supposed to be mandatory. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, if uh, you have any friends who are not present, I would certainly recommend that they show up to lecture. I know it's Friday afternoon. Everyone's uh, ready to get out there and go party it up at all the clubs and shoulder to shoulder with everyone else. Hopefully, they're not going to do. That. But um, again, it's really I think it's a detriment to them if they're not here to listen to stuff in real time because um, uh, they can ask questions. Um, they clarify things, and I think um, it's going to be, um, uh, they will not be happy with themselves if they get a bad grade because they weren't here for the lectures. So, anywho, um, thank you all for joining me. It was really great seeing you all yesterday. It was nice to actually see that you guys are all real and real people and actually did show up to go to school. Um, and hopefully, hopefully you like those growing round sessions. I think they're really valuable experiences for everyone um, to get a lot of feedback from the, the faculty, see how we approach things differently. You know, obviously how Professor Hilton approaches something is different than how I do it, than how Professor Sales does it, uh, and all of that. So I think um, those are really good experiences for everyone, for sure. Do you have to be on statins for life? Or if you make dietary changes, can you discontinue? That's a good question. I think um, uh, going back to what we were talking about, um, if you look at um, the risk factors, right? So if you have a history of cardiovascular disease, that would probably warrant lifelong statin therapy, right? Because you've already shown, even if you got everything else under control, um, that would still warrant, um, you could still benefit from those other pleiotropic effects of the statins, right? Um, you know, if you were at a relatively low risk otherwise, and you got your diet, uh, blood pressure under control and your lipids under control, all that kind of stuff, then maybe there's some room for you to, to go off of it. You know, And again, it's going to be very patient specific and provider specific in terms of what they recommend. But um, yeah, some of those patients, like you got diabetes, you got heart disease, like you probably need to be on it the rest of your life in order to decrease your risk as much as possible. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it. And you all have a great weekend. And I'll see you back uh, whenever. Good luck on your OSCEs. You're all going to do ex just exceedingly well. I can already tell. Don't prove me wrong, though. All right. I will see you guys later. Have a great day.